Late on the night of April 14, 1912, around 11.40 p.m., an Irishman named Eugene Daly suddenly awoke with a start in his steerage cabin on the RMS Titanic as a great crash echoed through the length of the vessel. He and other passengers then began wandering the ship's halls to see what was the matter, but crew members assured them that all was well. Daly, who had boarded the ship at Queenstown, Ireland alongside two women, his cousin Maggie, and a neighbor, Bertha, was hardly put at ease. In fact, it quickly became clear that disaster had struck, or more aptly, that the Titanic had struck disaster in the form of a large iceberg in the North Atlantic about 400 miles south of Newfoundland. As the gravity of the situation grew ever more clear and the frantic evacuation began, Daly, Maggie, and Bertha prayed together on the upper deck. Then, passengers began to surge toward the lifeboats, so Daly climbed into one with the two women, only to be hauled out by the ship's officers, who told him it was women and children first. Stranded and alone, the Irishman joined the other steerage and second-class passengers trying to get onto a different lifeboat, but he was threatened by an officer with a gun, who Daly claimed shot at the growing, panicked crowd, saying, quote, Two men tried to break through, and he shot them both. I saw him shoot them. I saw them lying there after they were shot." Unquote. Finally, as water smashed across the doomed ship's deck, Daly was forced into the dark and frigid ocean. Clinging to a lifeboat, he watched in horror as the ship's mighty stern suddenly swung upward, the nose of the vessel pointing straight into the starry sky above, framed against the heavens. Then it began to sink below the surface of the sea taking some 1,500 people with it. But how did the Titanic, the so-called unsinkable ship, get to this point? Over the next six episodes, we'll be exploring that very question, and much more. How was the Titanic built? Why was the world so convinced that it was unsinkable? How and why did it run straight into an iceberg on the night of April 14th? And could this historic disaster have been averted? You're listening to History Uncovered, brought to you by the digital publisher All That's Interesting, where we explore the uncharted corners of the natural world and the world past. I'm All That's Interesting staff writer Kalina Fraga. Today, we're starting our six-part series on the Titanic with part one, Building the Unsinkable Ship. Special message for History Uncovered listeners. For the next two months, we'll be conducting a survey as part of the Airwave Network to help us to get to know you, your interests, and what you think of the show. You can find the questionnaire at surveymonkey.com slash r slash airwave. And as a special thank you, you'll be entered for a chance to win a $500 Amazon gift card. Again, that's surveymonkey.com slash r slash airwave. Or you can click the link in our episode notes. One summer evening in 1907, two men came together to discuss an idea that they hoped would change the world, or at least the world of maritime travel. Bruce Ismay, the managing director of the White Star Line, and Lord William Perry, chairman of the shipyard Harland and Wolfe, hatched a plan to build several gargantuan ships unlike anything the world had ever seen before. These two men were leaders in their industry at a critical moment in history when sea travel was rapidly becoming safer, faster, and more exciting than ever before. At the dawn of the 20th century, it was possible to traverse the Atlantic Ocean in only one week. A century earlier, the same journey would have taken a month. But the White Star Line played second fiddle to the Cunard Line, which reigned superior in the world of sea travel. One Cunard ship in particular, the famous Lusitania, was known for its unparalleled elegance and luxury, and another, the Mauritania, had shocked the world by crossing the Atlantic Ocean in less than five days. So when Ismay and Perry met on that summer evening, they plotted to build not one or even two magnificent ships, but three. They wouldn't attempt to beat the Cunard line in speed, but rather in size and extravagance. The three ships they dreamed up were the Olympic, the gigantic, later called the Britannic, and the largest of the bunch, the Titanic. Cut 
construction of the Titanic began on March 31st, 1909, less than two years after Ismay and Perry's initial meeting. Then, the ship's designer Thomas Andrews, Perry's nephew, laid the first plate on the keel, the central spine that runs the length of a boat's underside. By this time, the Olympic had been under construction for 15 months. Building these two ships at the same time was a mammoth, unprecedented undertaking. Until this moment in history, no dry dock in the world was big enough for two ships this enormous, so Perry's shipyard in Belfast, Ireland converted its existing three docks into two in order to build the Olympic and the Titanic simultaneously. Both ships would require a jaw-dropping amount of time, effort, and manpower. Building the Titanic alone took 26 months, the work of 3,000 laborers and 3 million rivets in its hull. Both the Titanic and the Olympic were so big, and their construction created such a hive of activity that they drew significant media attention long before they even set sail. Despite the excitement, some newspapers raised doubts about the project, noting that the Olympic and the Titanic's size might make it impossible for them to even dock. But many more writers raved about the ocean liner's sumptuous luxuries, describing the ships as quote-unquote floating hotels, which would feature drawing rooms, smoking rooms, libraries, playrooms for children, and dining rooms. Soon, even the ship's lower speed was considered an advantage over faster ocean liners. By taking its time during the crossing, the Titanic would not vibrate and shake, allowing its passengers to relax and enjoy the many amenities that it offered. But even more than those amenities, perhaps the most impressive thing about the Titanic was its sheer size. By the time the ship was ready to leave its dry dock in May 1911, it was the biggest ship ever built in human history, and the largest man-made moving object on Earth. It stretched an astonishing 882 feet long by 92 feet wide, and weighed 46,000 tons, three times the heft of the Brooklyn Bridge, and four times that of the Eiffel Tower. The Titanic, a behemoth of the ages, more than lived up to its name, but beneath this veneer of size and luxury, it was hiding problems that would ultimately prove cataclysmic. Ever since the Titanic sank, countless investigators, official and amateur alike, have combed through the history of its construction in search of omens foretelling its deadly fate, but there were few visible signs that the ship was doomed. Even the deaths of eight shipyard workers during the Titanic's construction were considered to be a good sign, since shipbuilders of the day expected a certain amount of deaths while building big, expensive ships. The Titanic ultimately cost $7.5 million, around $200 million today, and eight deaths was actually considered a low number for such a big project. However, even if no one realized it at the time, the ship was fatally flawed. During the Titanic's construction, the White Star Line proudly shared the fact that the ship's hull would include 16 watertight compartments. The idea was that even if some of the compartments were breached and flooded, they would not impact the others, and this is what led to the description of the Titanic as unsinkable. I took passage on the Titanic, for I thought it would be a safe steamship, and I had heard it could not sink. Margaret Devaney, third class passenger from Sligo, Ireland. But as the ship's construction costs ballooned, the design of the watertight compartments was slightly tweaked. Their bulkheads, partitions in the ship's hull which divided into compartments, were built to rise just 10 feet above the waterline, which meant that if water did flood the ship, it would easily pass from one compartment to another. This change was not, however, widely publicized in the media. Perhaps worse, however, was the decision that White Star Line executives made about the number of lifeboats to include on the ship. The vessel was capable of carrying 64 lifeboats, and the ship's original designer, Alexander Carlyle, suggested building the ship in a way so that it could hold additional boats, but the Titanic ended up carrying far fewer lifeboats than it could have. Though it had more lifeboats than what was required by the 1883 Merchant Shipping Act, the ship ultimately launched with only 20 lifeboats, capable of saving just half the people on board. This has been frequently blamed on Bruce Ismay's vanity by the look of his prized ship, though sources vary on whether or not he ever truly said that extra lifeboats would clutter the Titanic's beautiful decks. 
In any case, most believed that the unsinkable Titanic would have no need for any lifeboats at all when it was released from its dry dock and into Belfast Lock on May 31, 1911. As a hundred thousand people looked on, the ship triumphantly made its way into Belfast Victoria Channel. Per White Star Line policy, there was no smashing of champagne against the ship's hull or ceremonial announcement of its name. As one shipyard worker commented, quote, they just builds them and shoves them in, unquote. On that same day, another White Star Line employee proudly noted, quote, not even God could sink this ship, unquote. At the time, perhaps the Titanic didn't seem to need any extra ceremony. The biggest, most luxurious ship of its day, it spoke for itself and stood alone as a marvel of modern engineering. With its awe-inspiring reputation preceding it, the Titanic soon attracted hordes of passengers from around the world who were eager to sail on its maiden voyage. After the Titanic finished its sea trials, it prepared to embark on its maiden voyage. On April 10, 1912, it left from Southampton, England, with stops in Cherbourg, France, and Queenstown, Ireland, which is called Cobb today, before continuing on to its final destination, New York City. To the 2,240 passengers and crew, the ship must have seemed like the epitome of luxury. It included a grand staircase, elevators, a gym, a pool, and even a squash court. Of course, many of the amenities were reserved for first-class passengers, who had paid as much as $150 for a ticket, or around $4,000 today. Second-class passengers, on the other hand, paid $60, or about $1,600 today, and third-class passengers paid between $15 and $40 or between $415 and $1,100 today. Between the time of going on board and sailing, I inspected in the company of two friends who had come from Exeter to see me off, the various decks, dining saloons, and libraries. And so extensive were they that it is no exaggeration to say that it was quite easy to lose one's way on such a ship. Lawrence Beasley, second-class passenger from Derbyshire, England. Among the passengers were a few of the men who'd made the Titanic possible, including Bruce Ismay and Thomas Andrews. Meanwhile, some of the ship's passengers weren't supposed to be on the Titanic at all. Molly Brown, a socialite from Denver, had decided to cut her extravagant world tour short when she heard that her grandson was sick. Similarly, budding tennis ace R. Norris Williams had been set to return home to the United States much earlier, but a bout of measles delayed his trip. He and his father bought tickets for the Titanic instead. Hundreds of other people, on the other hand, planned to join the Titanic's maiden voyage before fate intervened and kept them off the doomed ship. The American millionaire J.P. Morgan had booked passage, but decided to extend his stay in France instead, while Milton Hershey of Hershey Bar fame similarly put down a deposit on a room, but ended up postponing his trip home because of business concerns. Scores of other people, less famous and wealthy, were also turned away at the dock, oblivious to their good luck. But others, of course, had eagerly and purposefully booked passage on the famous ship. They included Eugene Daly, a 29-year-old Irish bagpiper who was traveling with his cousin Maggie to America. Daly quickly made friends on board by playing his bagpipes while others danced and sang. Another such passenger was Lawrence Beasley, who boarded the ship in second class to visit his brother and later wrote a book about the sinking called The Loss of the SS Titanic. Beasley, who recounted that the launch was quiet and ordinary, also remembered something about the Titanic's first few minutes at sea that put some of the seasoned sailors aboard on edge. As he recalled in his book, the suction and waves turned up by the Titanic's propellers quickly ensnared a nearby schooner, the SS City of New York, a British passenger liner coincidentally named for the destination that the Titanic would never reach. The smaller New York was pulled toward the Titanic with such force that the cables holding it to the dock snapped with a sound like a gunshot. The two ships were able to just barely avoid a catastrophic collision, but Beasley reported that the incident had disturbed some of the seamen and passengers aboard, who expressed quote-unquote the direst misgivings about what had just happened and what might lie ahead for the voyage. Though no one knew it at the time, the Titanic was just days away from disaster. But that's a story for next time. Stick around as we continue to explore the Titanic's tragic story from beginning to end. In the Titanic Part 2, Iceberg Right Ahead, 
All this interesting staff writer Austin Harvey will delve into the very moment that the ship hit the iceberg, revealing that the unsinkable ship was nothing of the sort. Thanks for listening to History Uncovered. I'm History Uncovered's producer, Kit Westneat. If you like the show, help others find us by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And be sure to follow the All That's Interesting and History Revealed pages on Facebook and Real History Uncovered on Instagram. Make sure you don't miss out on the new episodes and subscribe to the History Uncovered podcast. And keep up with our latest stories at allthatsinteresting.com. If you have a question about the show or just want to say hi, feel free to call us at 929-526-3029 or email us at podcast at allthatsinteresting.com. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like Legends of the Old West and Redacted History. Until next time, keep exploring.